Jasmine Choi, thank you so much for being on Flute Unscripted. Um, it's really nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for having me. Of course. And I just saw you the other day also in the store yeah. at Flute Center. Uh, and you were trying out some piccolos, right? Yeah, it was really an amazing experience. Whenever I go to the Flute Center, I'm so excited with so many things. Okay, first of all, with so many choices of instruments, including the piccolos that I've been trying out. And also, I think I have to admit, really, the greatest, one of the greatest assets of the Flute Center is the staff. You have all the amazing and kind and smart people. And I feel so welcomed every time. You know, last time I was in New York, we've done also the masterclass. We also did together uh, fundraising for the Ukraine kids, yep. helping kids. So I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. And oh, and we love you. Thanks for your your partnership with everything. It's really <laughs> sure. So yeah, we'll have fun today talking about, I don't know, what shall we talk about? <laughs> I think we should kind of okay. like, let's go back uh, a little bit because a lot has changed um, since the pandemic. And you and I connected for maybe like 20 minutes on an Instagram live um, right at the beginning of the pandemic when things were shutting down. So I would love to hear more from you about um, when that all happened, kind of how your life changed. I know you were savoring time at home, but you also took on a lot of new projects. You were um, streaming live masterclasses on YouTube. Right, right. You were doing interviews with flutists, um, which we can kind of commiserate about because you and I now both know what it's like to, to do this. Um, so you've been really busy. Was that like a creative renaissance for you in a way? <laughs> wow. I mean... It's really amazing that we're still in the pandemic. Yeah. People are still getting COVID. Can yep. you imagine? So when we did the last interview, that was 2020, right after the pandemic has started, officially started. And since then, I think exactly a year since we last talked on the interview on Instagram, that was the time that nobody knew what was happening Nobody knew how long it was going to be and the concert scene and everything, all the life has shut up. I've done since then a lot of new things. Well, first I started practicing a lot <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> and then still pandemic was still going on. So I was thinking, what shall I do now? And there are still no concerts happening. And then, of course, I went through this period that I got really, really scared. Okay, what if I don't get to see my friends anymore in, in the US, in Korea, by the time I was in Austria? By the way, that's where I live. <laughs> Although right now I'm sitting in New York. <laughs> um, so it was so scary. And then I realized, well, there's internet there's Zoom, there's Instagram, and so on. So I started connecting with first family and friends, doing a lot of Zooms. And then I thought, oh, why don't I connect with the musicians I love? So I started interviewing like you're doing right now uh, through Zoom. And I started writing articles out of these interviews. And also on flute series, so I interviewed a lot of flutists I love. It was such a beneficial talks and such a fun time. Oh my God, what else I've done? Um, still, uh, we're talking about like two years ago. I don't know, like flute <laughs> method books, right? Oh yeah, published <laughs> flute <laughs> method books one and two, the beginners. And unfortunately, it's only in Korean at the moment. We're working on translating into English and also in Chinese. That's exciting. Yeah. Also, what's exciting is that I've made videos out of the Flute Method book. So the videos are coming out soon. And then I felt bad about the young people who weren't able to do normal school days, uh, normal in-person lessons and so on. A lot of them asked me how to motivate yourself, you know, when there's nothing happening there's no concert, no auditions, no competitions, yeah. and so on. Then I thought, okay, maybe if we learn something together, we'll have a lot of more fun in the process of learning. So I started 
collecting some students' videos of playing short excerpts, orchestral excerpts, and I put them together and then started live interview, no, live master, master, master classes. And at the same time, they were chatting, asking questions. So it was half master class, half interview, and flute talk. So it was also a lot of fun. We've done about 10 of them. <laughs> and then it actually never ends how, <laughs> because I've done also <laughs> series for helping young pianists. Mm -hmm. so we've done virtual collaborations together. We played the Reideke Undene Sonata. So each movement with different pianists. So I put the two videos together and me playing in front of the green screen so that you know, I look like I'm in their room. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you kind of learned a lot of new, a lot of new skills within that year? Too? Yeah, editing video and yeah. doing the live streaming. Uh, it was surprisingly complicated. <laughs> and um, during that process, you know, I realized more and more how much I love playing the flute. You know, <laughs> anything else, I could do it. And it's, First of all, too complicated. And, <laughs> you know, when you don't love what you're learning or doing, it was very stressful. Yeah. That part, the technical part, setting up the videos and audios. And, oh my God, not my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I moved on. <laughs> I gives you a, part of my life. <laughs> yeah, it gives you an appreciation for, for the right. thing that you do love to do. Yeah. Right. And a great way to connect yeah. with people. I think that was. Um, it was really great to kind of see you engaging with the community and just making the best of the times and what they were and still reaching out to people and connecting because yeah I was yeah, looking so back great. it was a beautiful time and I learned a lot um, life is about connecting with people it's yeah. not just about how many right notes I play and I appreciated more about all the great people and friends around me and learning to how to help each other because that's why we're here for yeah exactly well and now that things are kind of opening back up you get to see friends and see people and your fans again too so what kind of projects are you involved in now what are you looking forward to um and what has the adjustment been like now to go back on the road and back to touring does it almost feel a little bit more difficult this time around well, first of all, I don't take anything for granted. I think I should put it this way. I appreciate even more every move I do, every concert I have, every musician I meet. Another thing that you were working on was the smart case. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Um, that project, um, I happen to have it here. Uh, this is the flute case called smart case. Um, this project has started even much before the pandemic. I think we started working on this uh, since at the end of 2016 or 17, can't remember. The reason I wanted to make a flute case was that I travel all the time and I wanted to carry less luggages, less something, you know? Yeah. So normally, I needed a hand carry and a handbag and a flute case, and that's already three. And I wanted to put the flute case into either backpack or handbag or tote bag. And we all know that by this much, it doesn't really fit into the normal bag. So that was my first intention. And this designer, carpenter designer, he took it even further. So not only it's shorter in length and it fits to most bags. He made it really, really secure, three-way secured. I can show you. This looks like wood, but it's actually carbon. Um, yeah, I think I saw a video of you running over your case with your car, right? Oh my God, that was so scary. <laughs> yeah, I still didn't let that happen with the flute in it. Right. <laughs> And they said after, well, the car ran over and nothing happened and it still stays this, this shape. And next time, let's do it with the flip. Like, no. no. <laughs> Not <laughs> worth it. Um, so well, and with everything that you kind of have your hands in and all the projects that you're involved in, do you ever have moments where you start to feel 
burnt out or fatigued, um, especially now that things are starting to come back into normal. Um, does that ever happen to you? Um, actually, when I think of all the things that I have to do, I promise to do, it's stressful. <laughs> because now the concerts are happening as well on top right. of all the things the most important things in my head is the next concert and then after this concert the next concert is the most important thing but other than that it's great that there are a lot of things to take care of a lot of new projects and I don't rush it but it's just like smart case it took more than three years but I'm yeah. like Sometimes I'll get there. Sometimes it'll happen. So there are still a lot of uh, new arrangements on, on the line and other split method books on the line and performance books on the line. And as I said, these um, videos for beginners, yeah. of this split method book for the beginners uh, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of along those same lines, do you are you the kind of person that feels like you say yes to everything or are there things that you do say no to or that you pass on and is that hard to do? Um, yeah, saying no is harder, but I do say no. There are certainly things that if I say yes, it's going to take a lot of effort, but my decision point is always to think, is it helpful to the food community? Will anyone find it helpful and useful and if the answer is yes I say yes and then I do the troubleshooting later <laughs> <laughs> yeah that seems like a, a good reasoning um, I feel like we could talk more about some tips and things that might be helpful to other young flutists out there and people that really look up to you so do you have any advice for young flute players that are now maybe getting back into school programs that are opening back up things in person um, navigating this kind of new music world out there that has changed over the last few years. Um, do you have any tips for them, uh, either about you know motivation or finding your purpose? I know that's a big one. Um, mm -hmm, yeah, kind of like true. staying, yeah, staying focused. Well, obviously you and I didn't go through this pandemic period as a student. So we wouldn't know how it is like going back to school, but I can say things in general, like how to motivate yourself, how to practice in a better way. I think a lot of people say that practicing in the right way, in a good quality way, it's important. But in order to get there, I think when you're young, when you just started out, you're a teenager preparing for college, I think quantity is also very, very crucial because during this time, working hours and hours and certain things, this is the time that you figure out your own way, how to practice efficiently. Without these hours and hours of practicing and yourself figuring out by yourself, you wouldn't know how to have a real good practice session. It's not always about learning every note, it's more to it. And also how to inspire yourself, how to be always curious, how to make progress every day. So that only comes from your own experience, from hours and hours of practicing every day. And once you do that during your teenage days, you will really appreciate afterwards, years later, oh, I know how to work on this. You know, you only have an hour to tackle so many things, but then in your head, you know exactly what to do. Um, everyone is different how to practice and what makes you get to the next level of playing out of your practice session, but you can figure out on your own. So I would say it's okay to put a lot of hours <laughs> when you're young, because uh, when life hits you after school, you have, believe me, less time to practice yeah. or anything. Yeah, and also the other thing is that nowadays I find concentration to focus anything on anything, for a certain period of time, that's become a new set of skills that a lot of people are lack of these days. I would say if you can only practice with full concentration for five minutes at a time, that's okay. But you can 
train yourself next day, 10 minutes, next day, a little bit more, 11, 12 minutes. Uh, I think that's how you build your concentration. It's very important because when you play the Prokofiev Sonata, it's almost half an hour. And <laughs> right. how are you do it on stage without budging and flipping with your phone? And, you know, yep. so that's so a very important skill, especially for the youngsters and also us as well. <laughs> How do you kind of get in the zone and get focused um, ahead of a performance? Do you have a pre-performance ritual, something that you always do or a set of tasks that you always do before you step on stage? Right. The funny thing is to get into the zone for the concert is rather much easier than getting into the zone for the practice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so that's, I'm more worried about. Before the concert, I don't do much, um, much of the ritual or I don't do much of anything actually, other than thinking of the concert and preparing for the concert. I think that's important for me not to have my focus deviate other than the concert. So I try to stay very simple. But for the practice sessions, I think I try to get into the right mindset before the practice. And then you can really bring out much easily in the practice session. So that's more of a challenge for me <laughs> every day. <laughs> and you said you were practicing a lot during the pandemic. Do you feel like you've, you've harnessed well, that skill still or has that kind of slipped away a little bit? Well, in the beginning, I practiced a lot. You know, I felt like always I was chased by time. Yeah. So I was always squeezed into practice time. And okay, now in this time, uh, one hour or two, I can, I should get this and this done. But then all of a sudden I have all day long. I'm like, wow, I feel so rich all of a sudden, you know, yeah. when you have some certain things that you never had before you're like wow and then yeah after a certain time it got old <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it was actually a very beneficial time yeah we needed it I needed it <laughs> yeah to reset and in what ways have you kind of seen yourself seen yourself grow um as a soloist uh, and I imagine it's kind of a isolating position to be in it sometimes. Um, so what parts of it have brought you joy over the years and what parts have been challenges that you've kind of overcome? As a soloist? Yeah. Um, so it's been nine years since I've been doing only soloing. Um, but what I found different and also more exciting and challenging and more difficult in a way is that I have to be always on top of everything, meaning scheduling and uh, picking which concert to play or not to play or which repertoire. So when the choice is wide open, it gives you uh, freedom, but on the other hand, a lot of responsibility. It almost that, makes me wonder too, if yeah. you have a, do you have a favorite piece that you love to program that is kind of one of your what you would think of as like your greatest hits um piece um the thing is I'm the kind of a player that I want to do something new all the time that's good and bad I think because <laughs> some people want to hear old repertoire for example I'm very known for the Paganini caprices yeah. And people want to hear that. I play that very often, but I don't want to put that in every concert I play. So I have to compromise uh, a little bit. <laughs> I also want to hear about your journey on your brain and flute, um, which you just recently decided to sell here at Flute Center of New York. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about your journey with that flute, kind of where the two of you have been together on your career and um, you know how you grew on it. Um, 
Yeah, it's actually still very hard for me to let it go. Yeah. That's why it took me more than 10 years before I decided to let it go. And even, I think we talked about this last year that uh, I was about to sell it. And then I changed my mind. Oh, how can I, you know, let this right. go? Yeah. Uh, but this time I brought you the instrument. So it's there. So yeah. this was my very first gold flute I've ever had. I was 12 years old. I don't know if many of the viewers know my story, but I'm from a smaller town in Korea. And there is a really prestigious music school in Seoul, which was two hours away from where I was. And I really wanted to learn more about flute and music. So I auditioned there and I really begged, begged, begged my parents that I would love to go to the school. So in the end, long, long story short, they let me go alone to Seoul um, at 12. They said, no, it's gonna be really, really hard. You have to come back right away when, when, when you find it really difficult. But how would I know? <laughs> I thought, yeah. oh, difficult, no idea. And I went there and then realized, wow, life could be difficult, lonely, homesick, and so on. But then that was exactly when I got this gold Brennan flute. It's a, a present from my parents, of course. Since then, for the next 20 years, this was the only flute that I've ever had. I didn't have any second flute after hours hours of, of <laughs> and days and days of working and spending time with this flute um, I auditioned for the Curtis Institute of Music met the legendary Julius Baker um, had lessons with him every single week for four years and went to Juilliard school with Jeffrey Kainer and went to Cincinnati Symphony played there for six years under Pablo Yarvi now you see yeah I couldn't let it part go. Of your, yeah <laughs> part of your identity there yeah, yeah that was yeah. um yeah it was more than my best friend every time when I get this kind of email you know you cannot just let it sit in your closet you know <laughs> I thought maybe it's better for the flute as well yeah. and for somebody else who gets this flute um so that was the time I started to think again and again but every time I was so close to decide I'm gonna sell it I was in tears <laughs> and I'm like okay no <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's how it happened yeah well we're honored that you entrusted us with it and we will um, get it into you know loving a loving new home and take good care of it but that's a wonderful story about its journey too so thanks for sharing that I might change my mind <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jasmine, so much for um, being on today. It was such a pleasure chatting with you and yeah. getting to talk with you again. It was fun. Thank you so much. Until next time. <laughs> <Okay>. Bye. <laughs>